Well, that's great, but how are we going to fit an air sole this wide into our midsoles? Yeah, but why not just show it? You know, it's not a bad idea to let people actually see what an airbag looks like. As a matter of fact, uh, I've got a drawing here that actually shows what a, what a shoe could look like with a visible uh, window in the heel. If someone asked us to name the most iconic pair ever, a lot of you would probably mention the Jordan 1. A sneaker that visually doesn't really stand out much, to be honest. It was even way less fancy in terms of design compared to the other brand's models back in the day, but it had one killer feature that would make it the basketball shoe everyone remembers even 40 years later. It's all about the marketing strategy, centered around a 20-year-old rookie who would later become one of the most influential athletes in the world, and he was left a mark on sports history forever. But for many of you, the most iconic sneaker of all time has nothing to do with Michael Jordan, and actually the success came out of thin air. Literally. The Air Max 1, one of, if not the most important Nike sneaker ever, developed in the late 80s, and it was a pretty surprising, even kinda weird proposition from our good old swoosh brand. The Air Max 1 was a brand new running shoe that claimed its main selling point was having hair in it and having it on display. Like, what? How and why did this seemingly just useless argument, even doubted by Nike's marketers at first, First, end up completely revolutionizing the sneaker world, becoming a cultural reference for running, rap, techno, and urban culture in general. How the hell did Nike turn air into gold? Hi everybody, this is Tinker Hatfield. New video, and we've gotta tell you about Nike's biggest genius move, which led to a series of absolute dubs for the brand and even allowed it to establish dominance globally over the sneaker market, in a time that was historically dominated by European giants. The Air Max Saga, it was basically the flagship Nike line that every real sneakerhead from the late 80s eagerly waited for, from the very first Air Max to the late 90s with the last true Air Max. What do you mean by that? To truly grasp how Nike changed the sneaker game forever with a simple air bubble, we gotta dig deep in some history that goes at least 40 years back. We're talking late 70s here, and Nike had been around for just under 15 years. Today, 15 years might seem like a long time to build a brand, but back in Nike's day, there was no Facebook ads or TikTok accounts to blow up overnight. At this point in history, it was tough, and 15 years was relatively young for a brand. There were more entry barriers, but there was a massive advantage. It was the dawn of a booming market not yet completely dominated by one or two global giants. We already had big players like Adidas, Converse, or even Puma, who were far from being out of the game back then. And in this shark tank, Nike was the small fish trying to survive. In 1977, the most efficient way to reach millions of people and promote your brand's products was still through television. And you can bet Nike didn't have the budget to drop millions on Super Bowl ads. So they turned to print media, where their early advertising campaigns found success in the States. Unlike traditional ads that focused on the product, Nike's message was about a powerful idea surrounding the product and the brand. That's the niche that Nike is still known for today, the idea of pushing your limits and always giving your best, selling a mindset set rather than just a pair of shoes. Well, it was also because, unlike other historical sports brands like New Balance or Adidas, which manufactured in America or Europe and had quality products, Nike was selling pretty cheap and low quality made in Asia stuff, which was a big no-no at the time. So they couldn't really compete on the product itself and had to get creative to sell what was around the product. This advertising strategy proved to be extremely profitable as Nike's revenue skyrocketed from 25 million in 1977 to 149 million in 1979. The brand, which was struggling to stay afloat, exploded, and that's when Nike's marketing genius was born, along with the beginning of the Air Max saga. The Air Max saga actually started way earlier than most people think. Many believe that Nike introduced the air bubble in 1986 with the Air Max 1, but in reality, they first put an air bubble in the air tailwind in 1978, even though we know that Karu had already done it two years earlier with the Karu Champion. And if we want to dig a little deeper, even in the 19th century, we had shoes with air in the soles, like this 1893 patent for a pneumatic shoe with an inflatable sole, kinda like tires. Of course. This technology, to be fair, wasn't all that revolutionary. Its impact on performance, comfort, or even a runner's results was pretty negligible. But Nike presented it as a revolution anyway, like they usually do. In the end, the air cushion was a small step forward for its time. From there on, they started putting air wherever they could, whether it was the Air Force, the Air Pegasus, or the Air Jordan. And for those wondering what was inside those air bubbles, well, initially, it was just plastic cushions filled with sulfur hexafluoride, a weird gas, kind of like the one coming out of zombies asses in Call of Duty. Ew! 
Nah, I'm kidding, but it's still a gas with a big impact on the environment. Don't worry, they figured out a few years later that it wasn't such a great idea. Since 2006, Nike switched to nitrogen. Not to be confused with nitrous oxide. Just in case, um, I don't want to see y'all puffing on your Air Maxes when you run out of Whippet carts. Don't do drugs. If you're doing it, stop it. Get some help. While this cushioning system was originally developed by a guy named Frank Rudy, it was another character who made it truly iconic. In 1981, Nike hired an architect primarily to design their new offices or showrooms. That was the main task assigned to him until 1985. Some of you may have already recognized this architect. It was Tinker Hatfield, one of, if not the most famous and respected sneaker designer in the world today, and probably for the next century as well. But at this point in history, Tinker Hatfield was in his 30s and had never officially designed a pair of sneakers. But he would ace this new challenge by creating the the very first Air Max, or in other words, creating what would change Nike forever. He first presented this initial concept, which was supposed to be the first Air Max, even though the model looked very different from the Air Max 1 we know today. It already had the concept of a visible air bubble inspired by the Pompidou Center in Paris, a bold, colorful building that showcased its interior architecture in a neighborhood surrounded by typical Parisian houseman buildings, all pretty much identical. His idea was to make the concept of air inside the soul visible, because according to him, it was a crucial concept for the brand at the time, but a bit too abstract for the general public to grasp. The idea was really to make it something like the Pompidou Center, a weird-ass UFO in the middle of other totally normal buildings. In a way, it was designed working marketing shifts, a product that already stood out visually from the rest. This design made perfect sense, but for Nike, which was far from being the market leader in the 80s and wasn't known as a creative brand in terms of design, it was out of the question to take such a risk with such an innovative design. They gave him an ultimatum, either the visible air bubble goes or he redesigns it into something closer to what the brand and the running shoe market it already offered. Hey man, that's not cool. Tinker Hatfield, who had just joined Nike as a sneaker designer, couldn't really push his vision, so he chose to keep the air bubble and totally reworked the design into something much less innovative. And his new version became the real Air Max one that you all know. Don't worry, he still managed to reuse his initial design by using the lines to create the air trainer a year later. But the smart asses among you also know that the forgotten 80s pair reappeared 30 years later as the Air Max Zero. But what really gets us going is the Air Max one and its chaos beginnings. It was like Tinker Hatfield trying to clutch on Fortnite. It was legit him versus the world. Whether it was the marketing team freaking out about selling a pair with a giant hole in the sole, or the engineering team having no clue how to create that massive air bubble in the sole, internally, nobody wanted this Air Max 1. Nike still took the gamble of creating this new running shoe, and after months and months of research and development to enlarge the air cushion and make it visible, the first Air Max 1 saw the light in 1986 with an extremely large air bubble. But also, extremely fragile, to the point that they had to reissue the model with a much smaller air bubble in 1987 to avoid punctures. It was really a shaky product at first, but the idea of the air bubble was really powerful from a marketing perspective. It awakened consumers' senses to the idea of air cushioning, comfort, and lightness. In fact, everything a good running shoe needed. While other brands were trying to present complex and incomprehensible technologies to most people, the Air Max just had to show its air bubble and our imagination did the rest, and that's what made it a global success. Walking on air speaks to everyone, and I'd even say it's a dream for everyone. Nike once again presented the Air Max 1 as a revolution. Maybe it wasn't really a technological one, but there's no doubt that the Air Max 1 was a revolution for Nike. At that time, the swoosh brand was on fire, mainly thanks to the Air Jordan line. They had surpassed $1 billion in revenue for the first time, and the Air Max 1, which cost $75 at that time, only increased their revenue exponentially, becoming one of the biggest bestsellers in running shoes of the 80s. The Air Max Saga and Tinker Hatfield Surgical work allowed Nike to climb the ranks to the top spot and finally become the new leaders in sneakers, leaving Reebok, Adidas, or Puma in the rearview mirrors. So, it's all good for Nike, they're on top of the world. But the hardest part isn't getting there, it's staying there. The folks at Nike have to find a way to keep the momentum going and not lose balance against fierce competitors, like Adidas dropping their ZX series or Reebok in 89 about to wreck everything with the Reebok pump. So Nike gets in gear, and the management puts Tinker Hatfield, the architect who had never designed sneakers before, in charge of designs for Air Max and Air Jordan, succeeding where all his colleagues had failed. Nike's plan is to capitalize on the solid foundation 
innovation they've laid, they're even putting aside other sneakers in development, like the Shocks, which should have been out since the 80s to focus on the Air Max saga. And here, Nike wanted to give us some serious shit. One new Air Max every single year. In 1989, it's the Air Max Lite that first appeared. The goal was simple, to have essentially the same pair, but lighter, thanks to an Eva sole instead of the polyurethane used on the first Air Max one. The idea was to have the same pair, but better, but it didn't really leave a mark and not many people remember it today. In 1990, it's the beginning of a new decade, the moment for Tinker to make a statement and drop a new silhouette to keep the momentum on point. He releases the Air Max 90, known as the Air Max 3, a pair that was meant to be an evolution of the one, but much more revamped this time. A more modern look, straighter lines, more thought out and worked materials. Even though from a technical point of view, it doesn't reinvent much compared to its predecessor, the Light, which had been the test pair to introduce new materials. The 90 sets the stage for the next decade of Air Max, because from now on, they needed to release a new one every year, and Nike has high expectations. 1991, they don't give up and drop something crazy. The Air Classic BW. BW stands for Big Window because they expanded the visibility of the air units, but inside the sole, it was the exact same air bubble as the Air Max 90. Nike wanted to redeem the initial failure of the one, which had too big of a window and was technically doomed to fail. Basically, make that big window the revenge for their failure. Never back down, never what? Never give up! But it's not just the bubble size that's gonna win the hearts of fans at the time. Besides Nike, not many people gave a f about the size of the air bubbles. The success of the BW was totally due to the overall design of the pair, which continued the modernization trend with straighter lines, just like what Hatfield wanted, but also a lot more material play, like on the Jordan 3 and 4 that Tinker Hatfield also designed. It has a rubber swoosh, a neoprene collar, a padded tongue, and black nubuck eyelets. And even though it's not the most famous pair in the States, it absolutely killed it in Europe. And that's thanks to three major movements in the history of this pair. Overall, the pair was already a success among runners, it's still a sports shoe, and all the marathon runners of the time chose it for its comfort and lightness gained since the light. But beyond running, the BW became the flag of several urban subcultures in Europe. The Gabber Movement, a 90s Rotterdam youth movement that was constantly rejected from clubs because of their style. These guys had a messed up look, shaved heads, crazy tracksuits, and tattoos all over their shaved heads. But it was mainly about the dance, which apparently required a lot of cardio. And also, not being sober, I guess? But that's not the only movement that put the pair on the map in Europe. There's also bubbling, another equally special dance. Grime, which popularized the pair in London, where the most popular artists talked about the BW in their songs, or even Dizzy Rascal, who rocked them on his album covers. But clearly, all the young people immersed in urban culture in Europe, whether from the UK, the Netherlands, France, or Germany, they rocked the BW. That's why the classic BW is often considered in Europe as the best Air Max pair historically. Anyway, that's the opinion of the OGs. Today, it's a bit outdated, and if you want my opinion, for me, the BW has always been the Air Max 90, but worse. I said what I said! After this massive success, it's time to go back to the drawing board for the next one. In 1992, it's the turn of the Air Max 180, with a quite particular style. Hatfield is joined by Bruce Kilgore, the designer of the Air Force One, and they completely abandoned the super straight lines they had ventured into so far, aiming for that rounder and less aggressive shape while incorporating a new larger air unit that spans the entire width of the shoe. You probably guessed it, the name Air Max 180 is because you can see the air bubble at 180 degrees since it's now visible under the sole. But despite this small innovation, the pair is still pretty mid. The shape on the front of the foot and the high tongue, it's kinda goofy looking, like you got clown feet. And unsurprisingly, it wasn't exactly a crowd pleaser. The following year, Hatfield introduces the Air Max 93 with a new industrial technique, blow molding, which also allows for a 270 degree visible air bubble this time. A far cry from the days when the air bubble would crack on the Air Max 1. Nike was really starting to master its technologies, but apart from the technical side, there's nothing too crazy on the design front, and the pair remains quite insignificant. Another year, another Air Max, and it was getting tricky for Tinker Hatfield. The old timer was running out of steam. He gave us a remix of the Horachi, and you could tell he might not be as on point as in the early days, and his next attempts made Nike realize he probably needed a little break. Oh! He needs some milk! 
For the Air Max 94, Tinker still couldn't offer up a significant new feature. They reused the same air unit as the 270, panels inspired by all his previous models. You could almost see it as a revamp of the Air Max 1, and more surprisingly, they introduced a Dubray on the laces. Something very familiar for Air Force Ones, but not so much for Air Maxes. This pair was part of the ongoing exhaustion of designs proposed by Tinker Hatfield, and it would be another Air Max that sold for a year without making a lasting impression, waiting for the next one to come out. Ah, oh, shit. Here we go again. But Nike doesn't want to stop there. They need something new. They're getting into a not so good routine and they can't limit themselves to one pair per year, especially if there's so little technical evolution. So Hatfield, already on the brink of burnout, has to come up with another pair the same year. And not just any pair, because it's the Air Max 2. A new silhouette with a fairly complex system for not much in the end. The Air Max 2 system used separate air compartments with different air pressure densities for different areas of the floor. And the advantage of this new technology was that, well, it was new technology? It's this new air bubble that allowed the Air Max 95 to exist later on. In fact, the first Air Max 2 already had the visible air bubbles at the front of the foot, like on the Air Max 95. At least that was the case on the early prototypes, but who knows why they were marketed without them. Probably just like the very first Air Max 1, the system just wasn't ready yet. I think adding the air bubbles to the front of the foot could have at least saved the design from a visual perspective, since the pair didn't sell as expected. Not at all. And Nike really noticed that because they never reissued it once, despite initially planning it to be a huge banger. This is not a banger. This is not a banger. So Tinker is commissioned to fix another failure, which is partially attributed to him. Therefore, in the same year, he releases a third pair to reignite the Air Max machine, because Nike really doesn't want to stop there. So in June 1994, Tinker delivers the Air Max 2 Lite, a revamp of his previous failure where he redesigned everything from a design perspective. He added reflective details on the tongue and heel of the shoe, revised the details of the pair, and really went all out on the panels. Basically, the the pair needed to be recognizable and leave an impression to overshadow the other one, and it's a bet that's generally successful. The Air Max 2 Lite was well received for its comfortable cushioning and its clean and original silhouette, especially in Europe, once again, without causing a frenzy either. So after that 1994 episode, Hatfield called it quits on that semi-successful stint. Dude had given it all he got, creatively and energetically, and bounced from the Air Max scene to focus on Air Jordans. Taking his place was Sergio Lozano, a young and promising designer who'd been on the Nike block for a bit, working on tennis and ACG. When he came in, Lozano had a massive task ahead of him. The Air Max saga was losing its mojo, and Nike was lagging behind the competition in the running game. Brands like A6 with their very first Gel Keanu, the EQT lineup from Adidas, Saucony Grid, and even Reebok was just putting out their pump technology and running shoes. The Nike running crew pushed Lozano to take risks and get wild with a new DNA for the Air Max. He took the challenge and set out to revitalize Nike's standing in the running world, and in fashion. He wanted to make these pairs a tribute to nature, blending geology with the image of rock erosion, biology, and the human body. That's how he ended up with the Air Max 95 design, the midsole resembling a spine, the gradient panels representing different skin layers, and the laces extending like a rib cage. The kicks dropped, and the initial reactions were, well, not crazy. Some even hated them. But Lozano said, if your design splits people between love and hate, you've got something worth working on. For all you you aspiring designers watching this, remember, if your design polarizes people like that, you've created something powerful. And Sergio Lozano's Air Max 95 eventually proved him right. Over time, it became a monumental hit, especially in the UK, even though it sorta became the go-to pair for thugs over there. The following year, Sergio wasn't backing down and designed the Air Max 96, in the same vein as the 95, inspired by the human body and rock erosion, but with a more streamlined look. He took the ribcage concept from the Air Max 95's laces and made it the focal point of the Air Max 96. Honestly, they weren't bad at all, but they couldn't find their footing back then or even during their 2016 re-release. Maybe they should give it another shot this year, throw in a Nocta logo somewhere. It might do the trick. It worked with the Nike Air Turbulence, why not with this one? Uh, why not? Faced with this second setback and seeing that the Air Max 95 wasn't the hit that it is today, Nike benched Lozano because they had to tackle the Air Max 97. Marking the 10th anniversary of the Air Max saga, Nike wanted a different recipe and as 
cool as Lozano's nature vibe was, they needed something fresh and more impactful. That's where a more experienced designer would come in. Although they underestimated Lozano's potential, they weren't necessarily wrong about his replacement. Christian Tresser, a name that might ring a bell to sneaker purists, he was the Italian designer chosen to bring a new perspective to the Air Max 97. He wasn't a rookie, having started his career at Reebok, and fun fact, he's the guy behind the Nike Mercurial 98, a football classic. With the Air Max 97, he wanted to take the saga to the max. He borrowed elements from previous drops, especially on the technical side, to let his creativity flow freely. For the design, he drew inspiration from Japan's bullet trains to convey a sense of speed in a running shoe. He also looked at the ripples a drop of water makes when it hits a surface, which led to those distinctive lines on the upper, with that drop even continuing under the sole. He had this poetic way of describing it, and I quote, The nature of it was water. Dripping into a pond, the water would drop and radiate out to the air unit. All right, whatever, dude. Speaking of the air unit, he went all out with the biggest one ever seen on an Air Max, almost spinning the whole length of the sole. That was a game changer to celebrate the 10th anniversary of the Air Max. It was the culmination, the holy grail. Tresser knew his pair was gonna make waves and last a long time. He was right on the money. The kicks became a massive hit worldwide, especially in Italy with their golden colorway released later. Nike even reissued the pair with Italian flag detailing. In short, these kicks united sneakerheads like no no other, and completely overshadowed the Air Max 98 that followed. That's when Lorenzo made his comeback. Nike called him back because three years later, the Air Max 95, which had a slow start, was seriously gaining popularity. So, needless to say, they realized Lozano had true potential. But unfortunately for him, the shadow of the Air Max 97 was just too damn huge. Even though he didn't mess with the previous model's soul and incorporated it into the 98, his new upper proposal just couldn't compete with the 97's design. He drew inspiration like he did for the 95 from his previous work at Nike ACG, which gave the pair that bulky look. He also looked to anime, especially Gundam, a massive hit in Japan, but not so much in the US back then, which was his primary target market. Unfortunately for him, the Air Max Gundam was a total flop. It was priced at 150 bucks, a huge sum at the time, making it the most expensive Nike pair on the market in the 90s. With no accompanying hype, not many were willing to drop that kind of cash. But before we even knew about his failure, a New Air Max had already come out, and Nike had been struggling to release this one for years. The Air Max Plus, better known as the TN. While most of their Air Max models were mainly released to capitalize on the success of the flagship line, the TN was a different story, and it had significant consequences for Nike's future. The TN name stands for Tuned Air, and at the time, it was Nike's latest innovation, an improvement on the air unit from the Air Max 95, set to be released in collaboration with Foot Locker in a project called Sky Air. Nike worked hard on the project, proposing one, then two, then a ton of models, but Foot Locker categorically rejected every single one. They were acting like like divas, forgetting that they used to sell fake Nike kicks with reversed swooshes and four striped Adidas before becoming Foot Locker, back when they were Kinney shoes. And these mother weren't so picky back then. Don't get too cocky, my boy. Anyway, around 10 different designs got the boot. This whole story was getting nowhere, and it was taking too long for Nike. At the same time, a new designer had just joined the Nike family, poached from New Balance for his solid work, and he seemed promising. So the folks at Nike were like, screw it, let's throw the rookie at it and see what happens. Not expecting much, but this newbie, Sean McDowell, had just returned from a trip to Florida where he'd scribbled some sketches inspired by Miami's sunset beaches with palm tree shadows. When he heard Sky Air, it clicked for him, and he was dead set on adapting that model for the TN and nothing else. But here's the snag. His gradient color scheme was dope, but back then, they couldn't pull it off. So they told him to stick with basic monochrome. This was impossible for him, since it would ruin his vision. Even though today, most TNs are sold without the gradient, at the time, Sean McDowell had a very specific vision for his project. He needed that gradient. So he went straight to Asian factories to negotiate a face-to-face -face with the factory and find a solution. It paid off because they figured out a cost-effective printing technique to achieve his gradient. The toughest part was presenting the product and getting it approved by Foot Locker. Once again, they weren't exactly thrilled at first. They were worried that the aggressive shape and futuristic design might scare off middle-aged dads coming to the stores. Even Nike agreed, but Sean sold it so well that Foot Locker decided to give it a shot and showcased the pair in one of its Los Angeles stores. It blew up like a bomb. They quickly realized this pair was gonna be massive and it needed an 
international release. It was a smart move because it did pretty well in the United States, but Europe was once again where this new shape truly found its home. Aussies may claim it's their favorite pair, but no country has shown as much love for the TN as France. In France, it became the urban and suburban culture's go-to pair, the equivalent to the Air Force One and New York pimps. In the 90s and 2000s, while most dudes were rocking more formal attire with Weston shoes and Clarks, in the hood, they were all about sportswear. It was all about Sergio Tacchini tracksuits, Lacoste, and the TNs, but those were expensive, and this outfit was mostly reserved for those involved in some shady business. Later on, it became a symbol of the French inner cities that got boosted by rap and also by the counterfeit market, which flowed through North African immigrants, because the TN is undoubtedly one of the most counterfeited Air Max models of all time. The success only continued to grow year after year since its release in 1998 up to today. In France, Australia, England, Germany, even some Americans are starting to slowly but surely wake up to the model. Depending on the country, it can go from being seen as a pair for thugs in the shady part of town to a pair for your average Karens out jogging on the bike lanes. But what's certain is that many consider it the last true Air Max, the one that closed the saga before the 2000s. In my opinion, it's the best sneaker Nike ever made, but you might not be ready for that debate. <laughs> Of course, like every great movie, there were some rushed, not so great sequels. After the TN, we got the TN2, the TN3, which is one of the few TN remakes that survived. We can also talk about the TN4. The TN3 already looked like a graphics card, and the TN4, well, if I had to imagine what ChatGPT looks like, it'd be just like that. But dude, those TN5s, that's a crime against humanity, a total flop. So for the TN6, they did a massive flashback, as if nothing ever happened. Back to basics, almost like going back to the TN with that early 2000s retro futuristic vibe. You can tell it was Shox's era. The TN7, very similar to the OG, would probably have some success today, though that Nickelodeon splatter effect might not have aged well. The TN8 has potential too, with a more trail-inspired look. If they market it right, it might catch the attention of the Gorpcore crowd. And we even got the TN10 for the TN's 10th anniversary in 2008. But honestly, it wasn't the best birthday present it could have received. Anyways, the Air Max saga has its fair share of classics, but also a ton of models that fell through the cracks, and nobody remembers, or rather, nobody wants to remember. Let's stick to the bright side of the story and remember the iconic models and the designers at Nike who contributed over these 40 long years, where each had their own label. Lozano, he's basically like the misunderstood genius, the black sheep. Hatfield, the soldier who fought on the front lines, whose creativity was drained but gave so much to Nike. We mostly remember his successes, but he had plenty of failures that few people recall, yet it's all part of his story. Dresser, he's like the one-hit wonder, coming in, dropping a classic, and casually leaving like nothing happened. Sean McDowell, the rookie full of good intentions, not always heard, but still managing to make his mark, almost like a beginner's luck story. It's safe to say that the Air Max has left their mark on their respective eras forever, and while the Air Jordan line helped Nike explode in the United States, the Air Max line helped them dominate Europe. It's hard to imagine the same trajectory for Nike if they hadn't had the Air Max to boost them to sneakerhead stardom back in the 90s. But what happened after the 2000s? Why do we mostly remember the models created before that decade? We could blame it on the global economy. We went through a series of crises and recessions, from the burst of the internet bubble to the subprime crisis that crippled the global economy for a good decade. Nike slowed down on new models and risky ventures, sticking to their classics and most iconic pairs. They mainly released new models with less ambition and far less marketing hype. They even acquired Converse in 2003 to diversify their revenue streams while staying true to sneaker classics. But that's not all. We also saw the emergence of a ton of new technologies, like shocks, which didn't last long, and Air Zoom. Not super relevant in lifestyle, but completely overshadowing Air Max and Nike's performance lineup. Then there were technologies like Nike Free and Lunar Lawn, more traditional but equally effective, based on Eva Foam. It wasn't until 2017 that we saw a real Air Max comeback with the Vapor Max, followed by the Air Max 270, heavily promoted by Nike and actually succeeding with the younger crowd, but that didn't really leave a mark on the minds of sneakers. Heads. We're not expecting much from the new Air Max DN, which is definitely gonna follow the same path as the Air Max 270. That pair got a huge hype boost from Nike's relentless marketing, and will probably just fade back into the shadows in the next three or four years. And that's kind of fucked up, because the pairs are actually pretty dope. But there's this kind of cannibalism going on with Nike's Air Max line, where the retro ones are so strong that they end up killing out all the new drops. Let's not kid ourselves, today the new Air Max models aren't eagerly anticipated by sneakerheads anymore, or 
performed by runners who no longer expect much from this outdated technology. When we asked you on Insta if you still cared about the new Air Max releases, let's be real, most of you don't give two fucks anymore. When we asked if the air bubble was still relevant today, the answers were mixed, but more than half of you thought it was a thing of the past. If you ask me, we've come to a pretty alarming conclusion for Nike. Just like with their Jordan lineup, the public only remembers the retro models of the Air Max, and it makes you wonder if Nike has become a zombie brand, only able to hype sneakerheads with models that are older than most people who buy them. Chewy trying to look like me. Y'all be wearing Chewy trying to look like Chris. Get your own.